So again, animals can adjust to changes in the external environment. So the internal environment within organisms, especially we're focusing on vertebrates, things with backbones, that includes the uh, interstitial fluid that allows for the exchange of nutrients and wastes with uh, blood vessels. Now, homeostasis means steady state. So that's the ability of these type of organisms to maintain a relatively constant internal condition or environment, even if the external environment changes. So temperature is a good example. During the day, right, the temperature can rise and then drop at night and rise during the day, get pretty warm, hot, pretty cold. But the animal, if we check its body temperature, it doesn't fluctuate that much because the animal has mechanisms to maintain homeostasis, homeostasis. So it has homeostatic mechanisms. And in particular, those that are, you know, warm blooded or endothermic, we maintain our body temperature for the most part. Uh, the mechanisms operate by a couple of feedback loops. One's, one type is a negative feedback and the other types of positive feedback and sometimes they're called feedback loops. We'll start with the negative. That's the most common. So most mechanisms of homeostasis work by negative feedback mechanisms. Uh, and again, this is homeostasis like for body temperature, blood salt concentration levels, blood sugar levels, those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> so what occurs with the negative feedback mechanism is the results of the process will inhibit the same process. So that it, that sentence might not make any sense here, but let me try to explain it with an example uh, that you might be able to recognize in your home. Uh, you have a thermostat that sets a temperature. If the temperature drops, thermostat turns on the heater. And as the temperature reaches the set point that the thermostat has, the thermostat switches off the heater okay so the imbalance the movement away from homeostasis is the drop in temperature the thermostat records that turns on the heater so you get an increase in temperature when the increase in temperature once that temperature reaches a set homeostatic level thermostat detects that and shuts off the heater okay so the process of increasing the heat triggers the thermostat to shut off the heater. So that process of increasing the heat will inhibit the heater, shut it off, because you've gotten back to the normal homeostatic temperature. So the temperature cools below the set point maintained by the thermostat in this case. <clears throat> temperature drops below that set point, thermostat detects that, turns on the heater, the temperature increases back to the set point, and when it goes above that, the, temp the thermostat will detect that, shut off the heater, heater shuts off, room starts to cool. If the cooling gets below the set point, that, th that senses, the thermostat senses that, turns on the heater, Heater turns on, reaches the set point as it goes above it, thermostat shuts it off. So it's a negative feedback loop or mechanism because, for example, if the temperature drops, the response of the thermostat is to turn on the heat. The heat rises, right? The heat raises the temperature in the room. When the temperature hits the set point, thermostat detects that if the temperature goes above that <clears throat> thermostat shuts off the response of the heat and then the temperature kind of drops back down to the set point okay so the response of the heating and increasing temperature causes the shutting off of the heater once it reaches the set point right so it's a negative uh, response or negative feedback loop because of that situation where the increase in temperature, the temperature increase itself causes the shutting off of the heater. Okay. So a uh, little bit of a busy diagram here, but in our body, we have a thermostat that detects our temperature, monitors it. It's in our brain, hypothalamus, part of our brain. So if you get, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 
increase in body temperature due to say exercise and your blood start blood temperature body temperature starts to increase our thermostat the hypothalamus detects that and initiates a couple of responses vasodilation increasing of the blood flow in the capillaries in our skin so you lose heat radiate all, radiate heat away if you've ever sat next to a person who's been exercising vigorously they're warm because they're just radiating heat through their skin because the blood vessels at the surface near the surface of the skin have opened up opened up increased diameter that's vasodilation more warm blood by the surface of the skin allows it to radiate away and uh, diaphoresis that means sweating so you increase sweat to do what's called evaporative cooling right the sweat dries and it cools off your body so those two responses wind up cooling your body once the temperature gets back to the set point the negative feedback mechanism is that the hypothalamus detects that return to the set point by normal body temperature and shuts down the response of increasing blood flow to the skin and sweating so that's why it's called a negative feedback mechanism the opposite if your body temperature drops thermostat de your thermostat hypothalamus detects that causes vasoconstriction at the skin meaning less blood flow less heat loss to the environment retaining heat and if it gets cold enough, you start to shiver. Muscle contraction generates heat. So those two things will cause increased warming in the body. Once that warmth, increased temperature gets to the set point, the hypothalamus detects that and shuts off these responses. So the responses are turned off because temperature has gotten back to the set point. So that's why these are called negative feedback mechanisms. So a little video here on this. This simple animation illustrates the principle of negative feedback, or feedback inhibition, in the regulation of the chemical reaction sequence in a cell. The sequence involves four molecules, A, B, C, and D. Three different enzymes catalyze the conversion of one molecule to the next. The final product, D, inhibits the first enzyme in the sequence. When the concentration of D rises to a certain point, the reaction shuts itself down. So that's why it's a negative feedback mechanism. Because <clears throat> as the reaction is occurring, more of molecule D accumulates. And when the concentration of the molecule D is detected to be the optimal concentration, like no more is needed, the molecule D shuts down the process of creating more molecule D. So the creation, the generation of the molecule D itself causes the shutdown of the making or synthesis of molecule D until this, because the concentration is, is appropriate. So let's say the molecule D is consumed for whatever process, in whatever process, as soon as the concentration drops, then the process will continue again to make more molecule D until enough is made, and then it shuts the process down. So it negates, in a way, the making of the molecule, or the response in the sense of the making of the molecule D. So that's why it's called a negative uh, feedback mechanism. Now let's contrast this to a positive feedback mechanism. It's much less, it's much less common. Uh, orga organisms do not use positive feedback mechanisms that often. They're important, but they're not as common as posit uh, as negative feedback mechanisms. Positive feedback mechanisms are less common. Uh, and they're called positive feedback because the results of the process intensify the same process. Uh, so, for example, <clears throat> when a blood vessel gets broken, right, a cut or a tear, proteins in the blood get stimulated and start to come out of solution. We say they uh, uh, precipitate or become insoluble, but they come out of solution, some proteins that are dissolved in blood, and they start to form a network, meshwork at the site of the wound. That's a clot formation. So those chemicals themselves release, those substances, molecules themselves, release chemicals that attract more and more what are called platelets, and other proteins that accumulate and increase the formation of the plot. Clot, I mean, okay? So the initial 
response of blood clot formation increases the accumulation of the substances that will make the blood clot. So because of that, it's called a positive feedback mechanism. The initial response, formation of blood clot molecules, generates more blood clotting molecules to aggregate, accumulate at the, at the wound, at the injury, to help seal the break, forming the clot. Okay? Once it's formed, then the whole mechanism is shut down. Uh, another example, well, so stimulated proteins activate more and more proteins, a larger and larger clot is formed. And then the other example here is labor. Uh, the first uh, waves of muscle contraction on the uterus, the first initiation of labor, um, they're not so strong, they're fairly far apart in terms of time. And uh, the doctor and the mother know that the baby is going to be born soon when those contractions become more frequent and stronger. So they become more frequent and stronger. Um, and in doing so, they increase in intensity and in frequency until the baby's born. So it's an increase in the intensity of the labor contractions. Uh, initiated from an earlier, less frequent, weaker labor contractions. So the process is sped up, it's accelerated because of the first initial labor contractions. So it's a positive feedback mechanism. The sequence of events shuts down once the baby is born. So a little video here on positive feedback mechanisms, and I think we'll get through this. Oh yeah, it's short. In positive feedback, a product of the reaction sequence enhances the action of one of the enzymes, increasing the rate of production of the product. Positive feedback is less common than negative feedback in living systems. So notice the process here is starting to go faster and faster as the product is accumulated. So the formation of the Z molecule here, as it accumulates, makes the whole process go faster and faster. That's the opposite of what we saw with the negative feedback. So this is positive feedback or positive feedback mechanism. Okay, let's look at thermal regulation. Thermal in the sense of heat and regulation in the sense of controlling body temperature. So homeostatic mechanisms that control body temperature in different organisms, and different organisms have different strategies. We talked about the endotherms. These are animals that maintain a relatively constant body temperature from their own metabolic processes that generate heat, and that's common, or that's a common thermal regulatory method in mammals and birds. However, much more common because there are more of them are the ectotherms. So these are organisms that um, get their body heat primarily from their surroundings. And these are invertebrates, animals without backbones like snails, uh, fishes, amphibians, and the non-bird reptiles, lizards, salamanders, snakes, those sorts of things. These uh, regulate their body temperature through behavior and the environment like a lizard that might be setting himself in the morning on a fence post or on a rock. And once it's up to normal body temperature, then it becomes very active. Okay. So there are structures and mechanisms that assist in thermal regulation, especially in the endotherms. So if the body temperature falls before, below normal, the brain's control center, the hypothalamus signals changes to bring it back to normal. We talked about this a minute ago. Okay. Um, if the body temperature gets too high, the brain's control centers again signal changes to bring it back to normal. Oop. So for example, there's your body temperature, normal set point. If your body temperature drops below that, the um, body temperature drops below the set point, control center recognizes it, causes things like blood vessel constriction, shivering, Increased metabolic rate, all that increases body temperature. Once it gets back to the set point, those processes are shut down. It's a negative feedback loop. 